battles fighting over um, the flagpole in a lot of these towns and camps um, with Northerners and Southerners after the war broke out. And so Confederates really thought they had a good chance of if they could invade the Southwest, they actually could have a foothold um, not only to invade the rest of the West, um, but also to move south into Mexico. Um, and that was partly economic and then partly part of this kind of national vision. And I think a couple of Civil War historians like, like Anne Rubin have talked about Confederate nationalism um, and, you know, people always are talking about unionism and patriotism on both sides and, and to what extent are soldiers and civilians motivated by these things. Um, but it seems pretty clear that the West was an important part of that vision for Confederates, that when they thought about themselves in the future, you know, winning the war against the Union and then establishing this empire of slavery, um, they saw it as having expanding borders and they saw it as being an empire coast to coast, um, an Atlantic and a Pacific. So that, so it was about ports. It was about a kind of sense of of the Confederate national future, um, and it was also about access to gold, um, which is you know part of the the port question, um, access to mining camps, access to that money, um, because as as you know, like the funding a war is extraordinarily expensive, uh, and this was one of the Confederacies, you know big problems. Um, they had good armies in the field. They were on the defensive a lot of, time, of the time, so they had some advantages. But one of their real disadvantages was a lack of money. And so to, to have those ports and to have access to gold mines was really something that, if they had succeeded, would have been very important for them and sort of evading the blockade and also being able to fund uh, the war efforts um, of the larger armies in the, the Trans-Mississippi and the East. What are your challenges of waging war in the Southwest desert? And this goes back to our discussion of camels in the beginning, because <laughs> the reason it makes sense is um, the Southwest has challenges that the East doesn't. You're used to transporting things with pack animals, with horses, with donkeys. You could take a barge down a river None of those things exist in the desert. Your animals can't forage there. There aren't the same river network. So that's why people thought of as camels as a way to square the circle. So how do they accommodate this different terrain in warfare in the Southwest? This is one thing because I am, you know, I'm a cultural historian of the war, but I'm also an environmental historian of the war. And so this was of great interest to me, sort of how both armies um, and then also native peoples dealt with this high desert environment, which is just not conducive to kind of moving large armies and large groups of people and animals through. And I think that this is, this is one of the things, you know, Henry Hopkins Sibley, um, who kind of spearheaded this campaign and pitched it to, to Davis and convinced him, you know, fairly easily um, that he could, he could take control of this invasion plan um, and be successful with it. Um, he had been posted in the Southwest for years, and so he knew the environment. Um, and so one of the things that he knew is that he needed to manage water supplies because what the Confederates were doing, they were mustering in San Antonio. And so their first, the first phase of their campaign was to march all of their men from San Antonio to El Paso, which is about 600 miles which is a very long way to go uh, when you have to bring pretty much all of your supplies with you and rely on, um, exactly as you're saying, there's only kind of one major river in between the Pecos, and the rest of the time it's small springs and wells, which are easily depleted when you have 3,000 men who are trying to get water for themselves and water for their horses, and you have a 3,000 cow herd that you've brought along with you <laughs> to feed your men. Um, so there are challenges to moving that large group of people and animals through a high desert. So that one component of it is water resources and also food resources. And Sibley thought that he could sustain his men um, on the campaign by bringing food with them on this first phase and then kind of living off the land in the second phase. Um, and we can talk in a minute about why that didn't work very well for him. But, um, but the other thing that I think they didn't anticipate is that when you're moving from San Antonio to El Paso, you are moving from a kind of low, humid area to a high, dry area. 
And so they were seeing their wagons, which had been made in eastern Texas, just fall apart on the road. Because if, you know, if you or any of your listeners have, have been to this area of the southwest, the aridity and the elevation, it shrinks. It, it sucks all the moisture out of everything. So it, it sh- literally shrank the, the wagons, and they just spit out nails, <laughs> and they would just collapse on the road. Um, and then bodies also um, respond to elevation gain. I mean, they were, they were moving slowly enough to, to acclimate, but they still felt it when they went on marches that had any sort of serious elevation gain um, in one day's march. So they were dehydrated. Um, they weren't eating a lot. They were on half rations most of the time, and what they were eating was very salty. Um, so by the time the Sibley Brigade got to El Paso, they were in really bad shape. Um, and this is the, one of the things, I mean, I think we've, we've learned a lot from the people doing soldier studies uh, recently in, in Civil War history, um, how people's bodies sort of behave uh, in a wartime context, right? Um, and then how their bodies are traumatized in a wartime context. And in this particular environment, these soldiers are just exhausted before they even get there. And this is one of the advantages that the Union Army in the region had, because that army was made up of Hispano New Mexicans who had grown up in this area, all over kind of 4,000 feet of elevation, and then Colorado gold miners who had been spending the past couple of years up in the mountains. So they were up over 12,000 feet of elevation. So for them, if you've ever done, you know, people are familiar with this, I think, more in terms of sports, where you go do elevation training. And so you go up and you, like, run or you play football or you play soccer up in Denver or up in the mountains um, so that when you come back to sea level, you have this, like, huge oxygen advantage. And the Union armies had that. They were not depleted by the time the two armies engaged at Valverde. Um, but the Sibley Brigade, because of the nature of the desert and because they were um, having to actually, you know, they were on horseback. They're still kind of moving through this landscape over months at a time through all kinds of weather. Um, by the time they got there, they were just in, in terrible shape and at a real disadvantage. Hey, everyone, I want to take a very short break on this discussion of the Civil War in the American Southwest to talk about how you can go deeper with episodes like these. If you like these interviews with authors, usually you can go out and buy the book. But what I found is easier for myself and other people is to listen in audiobook format, which you can also do with Three Cornered War. And the easiest way to get started with audiobooks is Audible. You've probably heard of Audible, but if you haven't, it's the leading provider of spoken word entertainment with audiobooks that includes bestsellers, history books, but also business, self-development, and news. If you have an Audible subscription, every month you get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. And you also get daily news digest from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, and even things like guided meditation programs. So with an Audible membership, you can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere you want to. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. You can listen across devices without losing your spot. And if you can't decide what to listen to, you can keep your credits for up to a year and use them to binge on a whole series if you want to. Just about every author I've interviewed on this podcast has their book on Audible, including this episode you're listening to on The Three Cornered War, and thousands of other titles, whatever you want to listen to. Visit audible.com slash history unplugged or text history unplugged to 500-500. Do that. You could try audible for free and get a free book. Again, that's audible.com slash history unplugged or text history unplugged one word to 500-500. One aspect too of the fighting that I had no idea about was very surprised is you mentioned the first multiracial armies are seen out here in the West. And I think my listeners know about the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, the first black soldiers that fight for the Union side. Oddly enough, there's also some at the very end that fight for the Confederacy, although they're more aide-de-camps, if we're being very generous, if I have that right. Not really sure. If you're being very generous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very, um, there was an article or book called Confederate Soldiers or Confederate Emancipation, something like that. And I thought, well, hey, that's a very catchy title, if nothing else. but. All that to say, uh, tell me about these armies. I had no idea about these. This was another interesting component of the the war in this theater that you kind of learn different things about the war from from approaching it from a different place, right? An unexpected place. And so 
the the Union Army was made up of this really diverse array of soldiers. It was Hispano volunteers um, who were, you know, had been living in New Mexico all of their lives um, when even, you know, before New Mexico was in the United States, right? So they were new American citizens, um, and they volunteered for the war. Effort. Most of them served in the first New Mexico, um, which Kit Carson was commanding. And one of the reasons he was given command um, of that regiment is because he could speak Spanish fluently, um, as could most of the, the white officers who were then appointed um, to serve. And so um, they also had... Uh, Kit Carson was also quite used to working with Native scouts um, and guides. Um, so there were some of those um, men kind of sprinkled around in the first New Mexico um, and other parts of the Army. There were also these Anglo gold miners from Colorado in this first phase at Valverde, and then more of them came. Um, they're called the, the first Colorado, the Pikes Peakers, um, to fight at Glorieta. Um, and they're coming from, you know, all over uh, the U.S. with a lot of different um, – ethnic groups, but mostly Anglo. And then there are army regulars who had been posted there um, and had not left, had not resigned to join the Confederacy, um, but had been posted at frontier garrisons, you know, in 1861 and had just never left. So there was this, and there were also uh, Hispanos who were recruited into militias, which were sort of used a little bit differently um, than the first New Mexico. So here is this kind of multiracial, multiple language speaking um, army uh, coalescing along the Rio Grande um, to fight for the Union in the summer and the fall of 1861, and then they actually did fight in, in February of 1862 at Valverde. Um, and that had some interesting uh, results in the Battle of Valverde because the, the Texans, who were all Anglo, although they, they had um, a German company or two um, from Texas, but um, they had heard that, and, and the term that, that all of these Anglos used um, for the Hispano soldiers was Mexicans. Um, so whenever they described them, they would say that they were Mexicans, even though they're Hispano Americans. So, um, but they were describing them sort of ethnically with that national term. And so, the Texans at one point, because the Colorado gold miners were kind of wearing some haphazard uniforms, um, the Texans thought that they were, as they called it, Mexicans. Um, and so in, in the viewpoint of those Colorado gold miners, Alonzo Ickes is, is one of the people in the book who sort of represents that, that group and, and voices their experiences. Um, he thinks that they underestimated them in that part of the battle. And so the Union was actually winning the first part of Valverde. Um, and to his mind, it was because the Texans had kind of recognized that they were facing this multiracial army and, and then had underestimated them because of it. Hmm. Okay. From what you saw studying this, what were interesting things that stuck out from this multiracial army that wouldn't be present in a typical Civil War army? I'm not sure if this is necessarily so different, because I think, you know, armies are big groups of men who are under great stress and um, are doing things uh, they don't normally do, right, in their lives. And so there's a lot of... um, there can be a lot of infighting. There can be a lot of disagreements. Um, and there can also be a lot of blame um, put on other, you know, if, you, if you're in a battle with another um, a couple of companies and you believe that they don't perform ex- up to expectation, um, you know, there's a lot of reviling that goes on. Um, and that happened uh, in, in this multiracial army of the unions in New Mexico, um, But it then had a racial valence. So there was a lot of blame heaped upon um, particularly uh, the Hispanos who were serving in the militias um, after the Battle of Valverde. A lot of the Anglo soldiers blamed them um, for running in the face of the Confederate um, charge against the Union line, which happened at the end of the day and which was successful. Um, of course, they neglected to say that there were all, there was also another company of Anglo soldiers who also fled in the face of that oncoming charge. Um, and so 
but their their critique of uh, or their criticism of those um, of those.